welcome all to the Standing Committee on Health on Wednesday, the 26th of August at um, nine o'clock. I wish to welcome all members um, present. A warm welcome to you, to all officials of the department, as well as to all guests. Colleagues, I wish to remind you of the rules of our online engagements. I will now ask that everyone online kindly um, turn off their videos and mute their mics. I see that I'm unfortunately in this morning as a guest, therefore I won't be able to see the chat function, but please do draw my attention by turning on your mic if you wish to speak by addressing the chair and also um, by using the raise your hand function. Um, colleagues, I will now afford the committee members an opportunity to kindly introduce themselves, after which um, the department um, officials present um, will introduce themselves. Can I ask members to please proceed? Good morning, Chair. Good morning, Chairperson Regan Allen. Good morning, Chairperson Rachel Benfugel. Good morning, Chair Ayanda Burns. Is that all members? Thank you very much, the department. Um, good morning, Chairperson. I'm going to introduce all the departmental representatives. Um, I'm Keith Clutie, I'm the head of the department. Um, we also have Dr. Dimitri Erasmus, he's the CEO of Tigerberg Hospital. We have um, Dr. Chris Valerji, the head of strategy in the department. Dr. Laura Andaletti de Tway, she's the head of, chief of infrastructure. And then Dr. Sadi Karim, he is the chief of operations. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Kluter. Is there any apologies? Um, no, we just have an apology for Minister Mbombo. Um, that's the only apology that we have. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Kluter. Um, colleagues, the purpose of today's meeting is um, briefing by the Department of Health on the safety protocols at the Tigerberg Hospital, which is the biggest hospital in the Western Cape, and the Paul Hospital Health Facility. Um, in addition, the department is going to brief the committee on the Tigerberg Hospital's infrastructure project, um, a current status update um, on that as well. Members will remember that that was stemming from a previous meeting as well. Members, just to make mention, we do not have any minutes that we will be um, resolving on today, but we will have a relook at our committee, at our draft committee program. And I think you will agree, members, these past few weeks, uh, the department has been very willing and available and forthcoming in briefing the committee and in level two of lockdown that also now presents us with an opportunity as a committee to also conduct other business. So we will um, relook the program of this committee. Uh, members, I will now immediately afford the department to proceed with the presentations after which members will have an opportunity to pose their questions. Over to you, Dr. Kluter. Um, thank you very much, uh, Chairperson. So um, I'm gonna go straight over. I will be in charge of the uh, slides. It's three different presentations. So we would like to just clarify with you, what is the time limit for the presentations? Because we want to be succinct and to the point. Well, um, an hour for all three be sufficient, um, Dr. Kluter? We will try and be inside the hour um, for, for that. Thank you, Chairperson. Okay. Um, so the first presentation will be done by Dr. D Dimitri Erasmus, um, and he's the CEO of Tigerberg Hospital. So I hand over to Dr. Erasmus to proceed. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, Dr. Duty, and, and good morning, uh, uh, colleagues um, and committee members. Um, so I'm the CEO of Tiger Book Hospital and the presentation I'm going to be giving is just to give you an overview of the occupational health and safety system that is in place at Tiger Book Hospital. Uh, just as by way of background, 
So Taj Mahal Hospital was, became a designated COVID-19 hospital for admission of COVID-19 cases early in February already, and we started admitting COVID-19 cases via the, the Port Health Authority, via the airport, into the hospital in February already. So we've been at this for quite a long time. Um, and uh, cumulative to date, we've admitted over 1,500 uh, COVID-19 admissions. So quite a significant number of patients that we've handled at the hospital uh, over this period. Um, so the first slide just gives you an indication of the, of the areas in the hospital that were mostly affected in terms of staff members who were found to test positive, more than three staff members were found to test positive. And, and in the beginning, there are a few areas where there were quite a number of staff members, and that would be our labor ward, which is the first one there, which is ward C to A. And, and immediately when we had the first outbreak there, we had then separated the labor ward into two, into two areas, one that just dealt with uh, uh, suspected COVID-19 cases and others that then dealt with the normal non-COVID cases to, to mitigate the, that risk there among staff. You can see the main kitchen where there has been no clinical contact at all, uh, was also an area where we would seen quite a high number of cases, and that was largely due to a, a cluster outbreak in that area. And then um, A5 is our, is our ICU, where we've actually uh, admitted a dedicated ICU, where we've just been admitting COVID-19 cases and managing them in that particular area. So those were the three key areas where we've seen quite a number of cases. The rest you can see is sort of throughout a number of areas, wards, in the hospital where there's largely less than three uh, 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 staff members with tested positive in those areas. The next slide, Dr. Kledek. Then this is just gives us the daily trends in terms of the, the staff members who were found uh, who tested positive with COVID-19. And as you can see, it's, it's almost, uh, it starts off from the 5th, 6th of April when the first positive case was, was found. And you can see it follows a sort of a similar pattern to what we've seen in the, in the province that there was a peak around May, a slight dip, and then there was a second peak in, in June, and now it's tailed off completely. Uh, and, and as of today, there is actually not, not a single case, positive case in the hospital at the moment. Uh, the next slide, Dr. Kritik. And this is, gives you a different way when you look at that in terms of, of the number of staff infections per week. And so you can see there's been this, this bimodal thing in May and then in, in June, and then it is now tailed off completely in, in terms of where we are currently. Next slide. Then this uh, notice is the hospital notice that indicates the, 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 the policy for occupational health and safety and the, and the strategy for, for infection prevention and control. And it dealt with a number of issues in that space. So it was about symptom monitoring and management. It was about staff risk assessments. It was about the occupational health and the infection and, and prevention control strategy occupational risk management, and then also uh, um, you know, uh, SOP when staff members were found to test positive. And, and that was circulated and, and workshop with all line managers in the hospital. The, the next slide then just gives you an indication of, of, of the steps and the structure of the system that we have in place. So we first of all uh, uh, have risk assessments, then we do risk mitigation, we do medical surveillance and then we do actual case management of, of staff when they, when they are found to test positive. So under the risk management, there are two risk assessments. There are two uh, um, assessments that we do. The one is personal risk assessment and the other one is workplace area assessments. So the next slide. So the first one is, about, is the personal risk assessment. And this is where we do personal assessments of individual staff members and we assess the individual's vulnerability. In other words, the, the individual's uh, 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 conditions in terms of, of their, their health system uh, status, as well as the assessment against the working environment where that individual is then likely to either make contact with COVID-19 individuals. And this is a, a policy of the department where there's a risk stratification that gets done. And, and out of that, uh, an individual gets scored in terms of his or her vulnerability and the area that he or she works in. And that score then basically comes out. And if a person is found to score between nine and 16, we deem that as an unacceptable risk. And that individual has to have a full occupational health and safety assessment of the individual. Um, and if the individual scores between seven and eight, 
uh, it's also it's deemed a higher risk, but it will only be acceptable for that individual to function in areas uh, if, if, if those areas are highly critical. The next slide. So this is the occupational health assessment we've done of individuals in the hospital. So 653 staff members, and of those 653, 37 were found to be to be in the very high risk group. And remember, so so this is based on the naked score, um, and and then decisions get taken in terms of of mitigating the risk in that particular area. So to give you an example, a staff member who comes out as having a high risk in an area like the like the sterilizing department, that individual does not necessarily need to be taken out of the area. That individual will then be accommodated with, uh, with in, in, in the clean area of the of the CSSD. In other words, that person's risk then of coming in contact with contaminated instruments is then removed and other measures are put in place. So just to give an example of, of how we mitigate the risk by accommodating staff who have been found to, 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 to be vulnerable based on their risk assessment. We also then have a, a, a process through the Occupational Health and Safety uh, uh, Clinic where staff members were found to be to be vulnerable and, and, and have a very high rate in terms of that. And they have comorbid conditions that make them unsuitable to in fact function anywhere in the hospital. Those individuals are then placed on special leave and they are then brought back in for regular assessments in terms of their condition. Next slide. Then the next bit is the workplace area assessments. You can move to the next slide, Dr. Plitty. Okay, so here we, we, we did two assessments and the first one is what is called a desktop assessment or an overarching uh, um, main uh, uh, hospital risk assessment that has been done. And then there are also area, individual area risk assessments. And this is where the hospital was found to be non-compliant by the Department of Labor. They didn't accept our overarching risk assessment as being sufficient. And we then following that and then done the individual area risk assessments as well. So Dr. Kutin, if you go to the next slide. So this is our overarching um, area risk assessment where we looked at the hospital as a whole. And um, in that you can see the first uh, block uh, indicates the management of a COVID-19 response. And if you look at the recommended controls, so that indicates there that we had in, that we had established a governance structure in the hospital that actually managed the COVID-19 response. And that uh, uh, structure was in place from March and met quite regularly, in fact, three times a week to address the issues in terms of, of, of how we manage the COVID-19 response. If you look at the second block, that block indicates unidentified COVID-19 patients, and then the recommended uh, uh, controls that were in place there was that for each patient that came into the hospital, there was a screening tool developed, and, and, and we also then shut down a number of hospital entrances in terms of limiting access into, into the hospital. Um, when it came to the unidentified staff members, which is the block three on the list, we can see there that we had implemented a screening tool, which is called a body screening tool, where, where, where staff members are then assessed twice daily at their workstations. So for instance, to give you an example, in my office, myself and my uh, office manager, we body screen each other twice a day and uh, in, as part of that process. And this happens in all the, in all the areas throughout the hospital. Um, so, so there are a number of those areas in this overarching risk assessment. If you could just go, so we've also looked at, the, uh, um, at separating the hospital in terms of establishing a single entrance where COVID-19 patients was, uh, would enter into and a dedicated entrance was in fact put in place on the, 17th, on the 12th of March already, which was at entrance five, where all patients who had any symptoms uh, of COVID-19 was streamed and channeled through that entrance and managed uh, according to, to COVID-19 protocols. We also completed a complete vaccine drive. So all, all our staff members were vaccinated early in the process to ensure that they were adequately protected against influenza virus. We also had a, 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 a PPE policy in place, which was part of the department with each department individually in the hospital having uh, concluded a, a PPE plan. Uh, the next slide, uh, Dr. Kripi. Okay. And then um, as far as, as, as limiting uh, patient access to the hospital, we had 
de-escalated our outpatients, we've de-escalated our surgical uh, activities to ensure that, that the areas were decongested and that, and, and, and that patients weren't uh, uh, put in a position where, they, where there was not adequate social distancing uh, maintained in, in, in those areas. Um, then just to go um, lower down in the slide, you can see there we talk about the, 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 the vulnerable employees, and that was just the issue about that I spoke piece about that we do these vulnerable risk assessments for staff. We also have a program of environmental contamination where there were clear guidance followed in terms of how areas were being cleaned. Um, and we also had a whole training program with staff um, uh, in terms of onboarding them in terms of the, the, the infection prevention and control policies and issues that they needed to deal with in terms of the COVID-19 response. Uh, response. And we had several of those rounds with, with, throughout the staff. Um, and then we also looked at the staff well-being, and we set up special a special uh, uh, clinic to, in fact, uh, which was called the Resilience Clinic, to in fact give support to staff in terms of the stressful conditions that they found themselves under, and to ensure that their emotional well-being was was taken care of. So that was the overarching risk assessment that we did, and then we also did individual work area assessments. So this is an example of one. So you review all the tasks performed in that area. You assess the risk of exposure as it's associated with different tasks, and then you determine the control measures in terms of that particular area. And this is an example, for instance, of the unit for infection and prevention control. And you can see that there we indicate the area assessed, which, the, which are the number of staff members in the particular area, and then the various processes that they need to be in, followed in terms of, of risk mitigation for that particular thing. So the you just go to the next uh, uh, slide. And this is continues that I can see that this is the approach in terms of that risk assessment at that particular uh, workstation. And it gets signed off by the occupational health and safety representative for the area, as well as by the relevant line manager in that area. So for instance, I can just pick out something else. So for instance, you can see when it comes to, to data capturing in this particular area, there was a mitigation step in place. Although the risk was low, we still indicated that capturing should be delayed by one day to ensure that there's good hand hygiene in place. Um, you can see for the, the, the one above that, in terms of performing daily office tasks, that staff have to have their own workstations more than 1.5 meters apart. There's no sharing of workstations and that this, the access control in the area and hand hygiene of equipment and uh, is, is what's quite important part of the, 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 the mitigating factors in that particular area. So this is an example then of, of what we had put together in terms of area risk assessments per individual area. And we've done this for, for all the wards in the hospital as well. Next slide, Dr. Clitty. Then we talk about risk mitigation. So you can go to the next slide. And this is where we looked at several engineering controls that we need to put in place to ensure that there was a, 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 a safe environment between patients. And you can see that this is what we've put together in terms of, of our intensive care units and some of our wards, where we put in these perspex screens, which then separates patients from each other, so that there's no cross-contamination in terms of, 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 of from patient to patient, and also maintaining a, a, a distance between, between bed, bed spaces. So that's one example of engineering controls. We had also, in some areas, uh, installed uh, uh, additional extractor fans so there can be adequate air change control in, 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 the, in the areas where patients are being managed. The next slide. This just gives an indication of the person protective equipment and the policy that, that has been implemented, and it follows the guidelines, the provincial guidelines, in terms of when uh, uh, and how we, we then uh, ensure that, that staff members are supplied with the appropriate PPE for the appropriate setting. Next slide, Dr. Lippe. Then we go to medical surveillance. Next slide. So this is the body screening system. So you can see this is a symptom screening and, and, and temperature also gets taken. And, and this happens between the, uh, the, 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 the fellow staff member and the line manager then, um, then monitors this. When a staff member then becomes symptomatic in terms of the screening process picked up, the staff member is then through a, an online referral system by the line manager referred to the occupational health and safety doctor 
who then does gives this per staff member an appointment to be seen and on the same day and the staff member then gets gets screened accordingly and tested accordingly in terms of, of that staff member and get managed in terms of being put in isolation uh, uh, and, and, and quarantine as required. Next next uh, slide, Dr. Kriti. We then go on to, to case management. Um, and this is where we look at the, uh, the exposure of staff. So this is the standard operating procedure that is in place when, when a staff member uh, is diagnosed as being uh, COVID positive. So when the test results comes back, and, and, and if there's been a contact with that staff member in terms of COVID-19 patients. So you can see if the person then has been symptomatic, there's a, a algorithm that gets followed in terms of yes, and what happens to that staff member in, in terms of, of following that right through all the way down to, 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 to going into quarantine. And then the left, if, the, if, there's, if there's a asymptomatic staff member, then the line manager then looks at that staff member in two categories, monitoring the exposure risk. If it's a low risk exposure, in other words, there was a distance of more than 1.5 meters, or if the PPE was worn, that's a low risk exposure, and there's an algorithm that gets good followed in terms of that. If it was a high risk exposure, the 1.5 meter was breached and there was no PPE worn, then there's also a process in terms of how the staff member then gets managed in terms of that. And every line manager has got the standing operating procedure at their workstations to ensure how it is. I think Dr. this is just a repeat of the of the previous slide. Okay. Then as, as part of the, 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 the medical surveillance, we we complete the 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 um, compensation to employees documentation because every staff member that is positive has to have a full occupational health and safety assessment before returning to work. And, um, and you can see here that in terms of the 17th of August, we had done 85% of those employees who had tested positive in terms of the, the COVID documentation. And 100% of all of those who had returned to work have had that full assessment and the full documentation completed. So there are still some staff members who, who at that time were still uh, not back uh, on, on duty yet. Um, and then uh, we've also uh, completed documentation for, for the staff members who had passed on um, and in engagement with their, with their relatives to ensure that we get that necessary documentation because all of these staff members were not treated in our facilities, they were treated in private health facilities and the onus is on, the, on the, the, the attending clinician to complete the first medical report in terms of that and we did assist the staff uh, uh, family to get the whole full package of documentation completed so the compensation can, can then follow. The last slide, Dr. Clitty. So this is the last slide, and this is just bringing it all together. Uh, and, and this is what the, the toolkit that the line manager has. So you see there are 11 things that the line manager needs to focus on and ensure is in place. The first one is the vulnerability assessment of the staff members. The second one is that area risk assessments gets completed. The sec one is then, third one is looking at risk mitigation strategies. So in other words, where an individual was was identified as being at risk, that those risk mitigation things are put in place. And then a, a PPE plan for that particular department, ensure that staff wear face covers at all times, depending on the nature of the, of the, 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 the task that gets performed. So in an administrative comp, uh, section, cloth mask is okay. In a clinic environment, surgical mask is mandatory. And then also, uh, 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 depending on the nature of the, of the setting, an N95 mask, et cetera. Then environmental cleaning protocol. So when there is a positive uh, case in a particular area, there's a clear environmental cleaning protocol that needs to be followed in terms of deep cleaning with a certificate that then indicates that that area has been cleaned according to the standards. Um, the seventh one is the twice daily screening of staff. The eighth one is that employees are basically informed uh, on the assessment and, 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 and management of exposure if they have symptoms. And that follows from the, the daily screening uh, uh, process that, that occurs. And then we also ensure that uh, the line manager also has to ensure that all staff members have received the necessary training in infection prevention and control. And then um, that the, the, the tenth one is that there is then a system for that staff members to ensure the line manager ensure that the staff member with tested positive has been to the occupational health and safety practitioner and that those necessary documentations are completed before the staff member returns to work. And then 11 
is thus to ensure that the staff member is aware and does indeed access the psychosocial support that has been put in place. And very often, uh, the line manager actually then does a formal referral of, of, of staff members to access that psych, uh, psychosocial support. So, Dr. Kuti, that's the last slide, and that's just to bring all of you together to give an indication of, of what is in place at Tiger Gospel with respect to the occupational health and safety system. Thank you very much, Dr. Kuti and, and members. Um, thank you very much. Uh, members, can we agree that we proceed um, with a second presentation and um, with a follow-up third one, after which we'll, we will then um, pose our questions? You may proceed, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Chairperson. So, Mr. Francois van der Bat is the CEO of Paul Hospital. He will be speaking to the slides. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Uh, the CEO of Hospital. Thank you for the opportunity to share with you. Uh, uh, Chair, the audio is not so good. Mr. Van der Vaart. Yes, can you hear me? It's better now, thank you. Please proceed. Okay, I'll try and uh, get a bit closer to the microphone. Um, so yes, uh, uh, thank you for the opportunity. I thought I'll start by just uh, giving an idea of what the current state of affair at Paul Hospital. So um, in total to date, we've uh, tested 5,081 patients. Uh, 1,331 of them were positive. 424 uh, were cumul cumulatively admitted to Paul Hospital as positive admissions. And we've had 115 COVID-19 deaths in total. Next slide, please, Dr. Peter. So uh, in terms of our staff situation, we've uh, tested 451 uh, staff members to date. 160 of them were tested positive, 288 negative, and uh, 157 of the 160 that uh, tested positive are currently successfully back at work. We are really grateful to report that we haven't lost any staff members due to the disease. Next slide. So if we look at the clinical services, uh, the first section was just uh, sharing some of the um, safety protocols that we followed in terms of patient flow. So uh, all patients arriving at the emergency centers are, are uh, screened and then streamed according to their likely uh, risk uh, stratification. We've erected a viral testing unit that would able that will enable us to test all patients that screen positive to make sure that we uh, we try and then have uh, two separate streams within the hospital of those that uh, screen positive and are high risk, those that are lower risk and screen negative. Um, obviously, if the patients are screened, they are placed in allocated areas uh, with adequate spacing to avoid overcrowding. Next slide. So for uh, um, to, to be able to uh, uh, limit our amount of patients in the ECs, we, uh, we only limited the amount of trolleys we have. We have curtains that we draw in between the, uh, the, the areas to make sure there isn't a spread of droplets um, and patients are wearing masks. Uh, we also make sure that the um, uh, specific areas have been identified if we do high-risk procedures that, that might cause sterilization. Um, also, we've made sure that our specialist doctors uh, are available to dispose patients out of the EC to make sure that there's good flow and patients are spending as little time possible. Next slide. In our wards, we've obviously got high risk designated COVID areas um, for uh, those that's not yet been diagnosed but are under investigation and also for those that are positive. Uh, we also try and cohort uh, patients according to their risk profile. For instance, in um, obstetric services, we have patients that's high risk. We keep them separate from patients that uh, lower risk according to their screening. We have dedicated staff that actually look after these patients to uh, avoid cross-contamination. So we have a separate staff group that looks after these high-risk areas uh, to cross-contamination. And um, our low-risk areas, our low-risk COVID areas are actively monitored 
receive these medications, developing symptoms, and then they need to be tested and put into priority. Psychiatry, we've had specific challenges because of um, not following the correct uh, etiquette, mask etiquette behavior. We needed to test all of our psychiatric patients and put them in isolation until we can prove that they are negative uh, before they mix with the patients. Next slide. Outpatients, we just have a, a specific, uh, uh, all of our outpatients are screened to, to make sure if they, if they uh, screen positive. We actually examine and test them if they desperately need to have the appointment. But if we deem that the appointment is maybe not that desperate and important, we try and uh, uh, reschedule and um, see if we can get them a, an alternative um, date. We also have a separate designated area in outpatient areas for anybody that's screened positive. <laughs> We, uh, we make sure that there's no overcrowding. Uh, we have specific seating arrangements to, to uh, ensure social distancing. And, um, you know, we, we try and give people uh, a longer repeat script to make sure our chronic patients don't need to come in. We even established some telephone clinics um, to make sure that we prevent people coming into hospital and being exposed to high risk. Uh, next slide. In theater, uh, we've obviously stopped all elective work. We've only uh, uh, made sure that we focus on life saves, saving emergency and urgent operations. Um, all of our procedures have been, uh, uh, our theater has been redesigned to make sure that we have a COVID positive and PUI theater, uh, and then all the ones with low risk keeps in, uh, is operated in separate theaters. We made sure that our air exchanges are good to make sure that there isn't a spread of any of the virus there. Uh, thorough cleaning between theater cases is obvious. Um, we also have a designated critical care facility. Uh, in the COVID period, we've, um, we've actually used most of our critical care space for COVID. And then the non-COVID critical care was actually in our isolation facility in critical care. So it's the inverse, but that was obviously to try and protect non-COVID from COVID patients in critical care. Then we've uh, purchased closed suction systems, uh, which reduce the risk of aerosolization within the um, critical care unit to prevent spread uh, to patients. Next slide. Okay, so now moving on to the occupational health and safety uh, uh, safety protocols that we've put in place. Uh, as uh, Dr. Erasmus also explained, we've done individual risk assessments for each of our staff members, also done workplace risk assessments for the areas to identify where we can improve matters. All our staff self-screen every day, and uh, we make sure that uh, they report in symptoms uh, even before they actually pitch up to work. Um, everybody is screened before entering the facility, and we've got thermometers that uh, managers, uh, line managers, are walking around and screening their staff with as well. Our staff has been well trained in uh, what is COVID, uh, on PPE, donning and doffing, taking on and putting on the, the protective clothing, uh, waste management, linen management. They've been trained on social distancing, hand hygiene, and also what uh, protective equipment to wear in which area. Next slide. Uh, social distancing uh, has obviously been enforced. In the early times, we've identified the tea rooms, meeting rooms, offices as high-risk areas. So made sure that we've uh, identified those and prevented those. Masks are compulsory for anybody entering the facility, as uh, Dr. Erasmus also identified. Cloth masks for those that uh, work in administrative areas, surgical masks for those that work in clinical areas, and N95 or even goggles for those that work in high-risk uh, procedure areas. Uh, we broadcast a reminder message to our staff and patients uh, about the five golden rules of preventing the spread of uh, disease through our, uh, our PA system in the hospital. Um, we've uh, insta uh, installed some foot operating door mechanisms and removed door handles to, to try and reduce the risk of high touch surfaces in opening doors. So people open the doors with their foot uh, we've done flu vaccinations for all of our staff. Uh, we've written SOPs to make sure that uh, people understand what they need to do when they screen positive. We've got our um, 
uh, employer uh, assistance program in place, Metropolitan Life, to be able to psychologically support our staff through this trying period. Testing of the healthcare workers. Uh, we've introduced the um, testing of our healthcare workers at Path, Path Care uh, to try and lighten the load on NHLS at the early stages when we were waiting long for our test results. And then obviously having COVID positive posters in all three of the languages. Next slide. Uh, further uh, measures for occupational health and safety. We've got uh, daily reporting on all of our positive staff members through surveillance. Um, all of our positive staff members are followed up by occupational health and safety practitioner on a daily basis via phone calls. And we make sure that they're safe and, and we, we track and see if they de deteriorate. Donning and doffing videos we've created to make the training a little bit easier. Gloves, goggles, visors, gowns, scrubs, surgical masks, all of those and disposable aprons are worn. Um, all patients are wearing cloth or surgical masks that's in the hospital and uh, our agency staff members, as well as all of our, um, our uh, staff, uh, staff members that we employ via contracts are uh, screened daily and individual risk assessments are slide. This is just a graph of our um, positive results. You'll see that uh, we've also followed that same uh, peak uh, that we have had around about June, um, end of June. And uh, you'll see the, the trend line going down um, a period of time. Uh, we're glad to report that we've now had five or six consecutive days without any staff positive screening. So we've seen a major reduction in staff uh, um, testing positive. Next slide. This is just a breakdown of the different staff categories that was affected most. You can see theater, uh, emergency center, our COVID ward, which is 4B1. Also the psychiatric ward stood out as areas of high risk where there was a lot of positive uh, staff members um, tested. Next slide. This is just the different staff categories, which was mostly affected. So you see nurses have been uh, mostly hit staff nurses, uh, nursing assistants, and our registered nurses, and then also quite a lot of um, housekeepers, and medical officers. Slide. So this is just a, a weekly graph of uh, the quantity of tests that we've done on our staff and the positive results. And you see the typical uh, bell curve, uh, attracted bell curve that you see there spend much time on that. Next slide. Okay, so, so now focusing on infection prevention control measures, uh, you see a bit of uh, repetition, so I'll go, go through it a bit quicker. Uh, we've made sure that all our staff are trained regarding all of those different areas, so that's very similar to what, we, what I've just uh, shared with you. We can go on to the next slide. Um, safety measures, uh, social distancing, masks, broadcast reminders, posters, environmental cleaning, food operated door mechanisms, the um, COVID positive bodies uh, is important that when there is a COVID positive patient, there is some, uh, some work that needs to be done to make sure that there isn't a spread of disease when the uh, undertaker come and fetch them. So making sure that they uh, triple bag, waterproof, and uh, make sure that there's a uh, fingerprint protocol being followed to prevent the spread there. And then also uh, there was a change in the method of testing to mid no swap to prevent sterilization of the virus. So there was also an improvement which was made uh, eventually. The IPC safety measures. Um, so uh, we've written a new SOP. Uh, we've made sure that there's good environmental cleaning, which is scheduled in all of the high risk areas, which is now obviously more frequently. Uh, all of the PPE of the, of the patients or the staff members that actually clean are, are being done, donning and doffing, correct use of chemicals, also the cleaning and disinfecting section of the bottle. So those were all SOPs written and given to staff to help them. And hygiene, we've got battery operated alcohol hand uh, rub dispensers that uh, are at the entrances and exits for all of our staff members and all of our patients. We've also purchased some uh, alcohol based hand rub. Uh, in carry on bottles that people can clip onto their uniforms so that they have alcohol hand rub available wherever they go through the hospital. Um, and 
we've uh, made sure that we've got adequate alcohol hand rub bottles for all of our admin staff members, which they could actually come and refill at our pharmacy. Uh, obviously, also daily reporting on all positive patients and staff members. Here's just a graph of all of our COVID positive patient stats. Uh, and you can see clearly that uh, peak around about uh, middle to end of June on the amount of patients that we tested. Um, and then also the amount of positives peak around about the same time. Moving on to the next slide. So uh, some of the governance stuff that we've done is we've recruited some extra staff to support our frontline point, uh, uh, frontline uh, nurses and doctors, so during the peak of the pandemic, now we've appointed six medical officers extra on six months contract, 21 nurses, this is to try and help with the absenteeism that we've had and the big patient load. Uh, we've also bolstered our admin and clerical support services at the agency to make sure that we run. Next slide. So, in terms of equipment that we've purchased, obviously lots of medical equipment that was purchased. A couple of examples, high flows, beach tires, infusion pumps, video laryngoscopes, scopes, and CGs. The list goes on and on. Other equipment that we purchased was beds, mattresses, overbed tables, medicine trolleys, all of that. You can imagine as we open up new areas, all of those areas are stock. So we purchased equipment. Some services that we need to purchase to make sure that we can deal with this, to make sure we can take service with. Um, my, excuse me, Mr. Van der Watt, my apologies for interrupting you. Um, can I please ask you, um, the audio is quite bad and coming and going at this stage. Can I just perhaps afford an opportunity to just position yourself and see if it gets better, please? Okay, hey, I'm... Uh... I've got my nose right up to the screen. I don't know if that's any better. That sounds better. Thank you so much. Okay, so uh, I'm almost done. Some of the services that we've procured to, to make it better was uh, we've re realized that we need to follow a stringent cleaning protocol. So we've expanded our cleaning contract. We've also purchased some external contracting that um, that is companies that come in with uh, with uh, this. Uh, that they actually help us to deep clean areas of high risk and areas where there was a positive outbreak. We've uh, rented and erected a viral testing unit. Uh, we've also had extra security that we've uh, procured during this time. We've purchased an ambulance contract to help with the uh, transport of patients between Paul and Sonstal. Uh, we needed to, con to contract ex extra uh, containers and, and make sure that we have storage space to clean some clinical space. And we've also uh, needed to procure extra wall mounted oxygen points. Some of the safe protocol purchases. In terms of medical supplies, obviously uh, lots of uh, personal protective equipment, scrubs, gowns, inclusive goggles, visors, uh, many mentioned the uh, clip on uh, hand sanitizers. Also purchased disposable suction bottles uh, to make sure we have no suction unit that I can take care. Massive increase in all stock levels of PPE. Purchased hand sanitizers and masks and disinfectants for our non-clinical staff to make sure we keep them safe. And uh, I've already mentioned the quick stop uh, for the doors to try and prevent spread. Okay, just the last slide. Some of the lessons we've learned, which are thing is we've realized that without our staff and our hospitals make sure that we're safe appreciate it. My apologies um, again to interrupt you, Mr. Fanavat. We are unable to hear you at this point. Okay, so um Chairperson, I will I will go through it quickly. So this is the lessons learned at Paul Hospital. It's really to engage staff, uh, keep them safe, listen to them, keep them informed, find ways to appreciate them involve them. Um, staff will get infected, so you adjust your planning to accommodate staff absenteeism. Your higher risk of staff is colleagues in the community, not the patients. That's what we've learned across all the facilities. So it's on your way to work, it's in the tea room, it's on your way back from work. You don't have time, so we must plan immediately, act quickly. 
there's more to do than time allows. So you must be very agile and move quickly. Be flexible. Your best laid plans will change and you need to change all the time because new information comes to light. You can't do it alone. You need a high, whole of society approach. <clears throat> so hospitals must be connected to a whole the whole plat platform, the private hospitals, municipality, NGOs, facility boards, local businesses, everybody. And then look after yourself. It's not a sprint, it's a marathon. Personal resilience, mental health stuff is a key thing. It's okay to take some time out and for people to pace themselves in relation to this. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Sorry about the audio. Thank you very much, Mr. Panavat. Thank you, Dr. Kluter. Uh, we may proceed now with the Tigerberg Hospital infrastructure um, presentation, please. Thank you, Chairperson. I'm going to ask Dr. Laura Angeliti de Tue to lead us um, quickly in terms of these slides. Thank you. Yes, good morning, everybody. I'm not going to go through all the uh, initial slides because you know the situation very well. So if you go next, uh, next slide, please. Uh, we, we, uh, we, as you know, we did a lot of work on Tigerberg uh, since uh, 2005. And uh, we are uh, uh, we are planning for uh, some major uh, uh, re reconstruction of the hospital. So that is something that we are doing, and this is just to introduce uh, the hospital as it is. I just want to mention, uh, if uh, we go to the next slide, a lifespan of an hospital generally is uh, something like 30 years. So the hospital actually, after 30 years, is considered as a functional uh, obsolete. So for that reason, one of the reasons is uh, also the functionality of the hospital that uh, is not, uh, is not uh, too uh, standard anymore. This is just to give you some more information about the hospital. Next. Um, next slide, please. Yes. So uh, we did uh, this assessment in 2005 with the CSR and then uh, follow up in a few years ago by another assessment and we know that we have an issue related to the maintenance or the lack of maintenance and the difficulty with the functionality as i mentioned earlier and the issue about the staff that is not actually the ideal place to work due to the uh, you know the kind of hospital that was designed in the at the end of the 50s next yeah for that reason what we we try to do was to have a program they could consider three major outcomes. One is to keep the hospital functional, and this is what I'm focusing today. The second one is to have the relocation or the, the building of the new central hospital, and then according to the uh, following the PPP process at this point in time. And the next one is the new regional hospital that we found a site on uh, uh, that, uh, that by the provincial government that is in Belar where uh, we are planning to build uh, the 550 beds uh, new regional Tigerberg. And currently, uh, we are busy with the strategic brief and the clinical brief. Next. So the, the, what happened with the maintenance and remedial work strategy? In, uh, in 2018, provincial treasury uh, gave us confirmation that we can have uh, almost 2 billion rent for a 10-year program for the uh, maintenance and remedial work for Tageber Hospital. In allo uh, the allocation was uh, 150 million in 1920 and uh, 150 million in this financial year in 2021. So what uh, we are looking is to try to address the major, uh, um, the major lack of maintenance and try to, uh, as I said, keep the hospital functional until we have the new two new hospitals. Next. So we, we look at the 10-year the, the maintenance strategy under different point of view. Of course, the condition of the hospital, the safety for patients and, uh, and for staff, the, to minimize the, what we call it the decanting, so it's the movement a bit of, uh, of words or area for, uh, uh, due to renovation in order not to um, have a major impact on the service delivery. Of course, uh, to keep the operational efficiency and then uh, to go for... Uh, a major approach to the big site. The site is 64 um, hectares, and uh, we are also looking at the way to improve the management of the entire state, where there are 
different kind of, uh, of uh, stakeholders, universities, uh, NGOs, and private sector. Thanks. Next. So la, what we look at, uh, the NIA means uh, the National Infrastructure Asset Maintenance Management is a standard that was uh, issued by the CIDB a few years ago. And then we, co we, uh, lo we are looking at this method of prioritization of project. And we identified uh, uh, five uh, major areas. Uh, one is uh, the project that we were already running. Then we call it the custodian project. And those projects that are uh, planned, implemented by public works, because they, are not, they don't have any interaction with the clinical area. So, so for that reason, public works uh, is uh, uh, fully implementing uh, this, uh, we call it custodian, as a public works is the custodian of the facilities. Then, of course, uh, there are some priorities on the, from the risk, especially from, in the relation to the fire and the safety. And then we finalize uh, the top priority, priority project and then other priorities. Next. So that is what we have done so far. Uh, so far, we spent 73 million, almost 74 million. And then uh, as a, we, we, we have quite a lot of project in, uh, in, uh, in planning, in design. And then, of course, we have completed at the moment two uh, phases uh, or the phase three of the airline unit in block C, that is uh, the upgrading of the air conditioning. And then, of course, uh, due to the fact that the hospital has got 31 lift, uh, is an ongoing kind of uh, work uh, to keep uh, man maintain and up upgrade uh, and update uh, those lift. Next. So the, the project that we have completed this financial year in quarter one, so the, we call it phase one of the theater, block B. And as you see, there is uh, some photo of the, uh, the theater block and uh, what uh, we spent 46 million. Then the main kitchen is, a, is a, another, another major uh, issue because the kitchen is right in the basement and uh, it's been always a major issue related to ventilation and, uh, and the management of the entire service and flow. And then, uh, of course, as, uh, as Dr. Dimitri Erasmus mentioned, we had to work uh, on the uh, due to the pandemic, uh, to try to improve the condition of some words to where to have a, a COVID patient. Next. So these are photos of the theater, the theater on block B, uh, first and uh, after the uh, renovation. Next. This is the kitchen also uh, that you, as you see, is a quite uh, a, a big area. This is a main kitchen. Then on the other side, there is uh, the, uh, the, the small uh, kitchen for uh, the uh, breakfast delivery, but uh, is, a, is a major project for the renovation completed right in the, in the basement of the hospital. Next. And this one uh, are the project uh, in construction. One of the major one, and it was a major safety issue, was the upgrading of uh, the 11 kVA uh, electricity. So this is under construction, is extremely important project. Uh, due to the fact that we had to stabilize the, the electricity for the hospital and provide the right uh, um, standby generator panel. So that is uh, on undergoing. Then, of course, the fire is one of our compliance, is one of the priorities that we do it in, uh, in, in stages because we cannot uh, get in time. So at the moment, we are busy in, Pro in Protea Court and in, in the doctor residence. And then, as I mentioned, the 31 lift. So we are proceeding with some lift. And then uh, the world ventilation system as uh, improving uh, the, uh, uh, the the air as uh, you know also for the COVID uh, uh, patient. Next. So this is uh, the last slides and uh, some uh, you know we are busy you know the total re requirement for the hospital for uh, fully uh, repair and innovation is five billion at the moment we got two point four billion so every money that we spend is done in the most. Uh, uh, top priority that we, we know that is value for money. So 16 projects are quite uh, over budget at this point in time. So we need to see what we can do in, in relation to the affordability. And then, uh, as, uh, as I mentioned earlier, there are uh, in total at the moment 33. But we have the full 10-year uh, maintenance plan that uh, we are uh, running parallel to with the development of the other two, that is uh, the, the central hospital via the PPP, and the regional hospital via the BFI, that is the budget uh, um, budget infrastructure uh, finance. Thank you very much. Thank you very much um, for 
presenting to us this morning. Members, can you please indicate by the show of hands um, if you wish to have any questions? Are you covered by the presentations, members? Okay, I recognize Member Barnes, Member Allen. Any other members? Chairperson. Member Van Vogel. I recognize um, you as well as Member Bota. Um, in that order, please, members, please proceed. Member Allen. Thank you so much, Chairperson. Um, I am hugely covered, Chairperson, but I just have one query and one comment. Um, I wish to thank um, Dr. Kluter and his um, office as well for assisting with regard to a Tiger Bird patient that was unable to to undergo a surgery during the difficulties of COVID, um, and they assisted with regard to steps that the resident can take in approaching the banking ombudsman, et cetera. So thank you, Dr. Kluter, for that. But I would want to get further information regarding the isolation of psychiatric patients. Um, in terms of the slide presentation, if a person, um, if a psychiatric person um, is potentially um, COVID positive, they are placed in isolation. In my head, Dr. Andrew Uche, in my head, um, I wouldn't be able to imagine the difficulty that such a patient would be undergoing during that time. Um, do we have a 24-hour where they are constantly um, under surveillance, they are watched, um, what is being done in order to, to, fear, uh, to calm their fears? Um, but thank you for the detailed presentations, Chairperson, and um, to the department. Thank you. Thank you very much, Member Allen. You may proceed, Member Barnes. Thank you, Chairperson. Um, thank you for giving me opportunity to ask a few questions. I must say, though, from the side of occupational health and safety, I'm well covered. I also had an opportunity. Uh, from HOD himself in an incident I had in my uh, constituency. So the, what was presented, mostly of it, uh, I, I'm, I'm aware on how it happened and why are we there. So I don't have much questions. What I would be asking now would just be clarity for where I'm a bit still confused, but either than that, I'm fine. Uh, the presentation of Mr. Van der Watt, uh, I think the one before the last, he was speaking of, 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 of cleaning of external contra contractors. Uh, yeah. What I wanted to know, the cleaning of the external contractors, is it for the entire province or is it just for the for the specific hospital? Oh, by the way, let me also ask this question. The cleaning of the hospital is the staff that is responsible. I'm deliber deliberately also asking that question because I have picked up in the process of, 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 of patients being in hospital, going into hospital and becoming sick of COVID while they are in the hospital. You went in for a broken arm, but while you are in hospital, then you contract COVID. So I, in my normal mind, I thought, could it be, is it the cleaning, may the way they are cleaning or what could it be? So maybe if I can just get an explanation how that is happening. Um, my second question would be on the last part. Uh, the, 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 the completed projects of the hospital, Tigerberg. If I could just get um, 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 indication as to what projects uh, are completed, are those completed pro projects the critical ones? Yeah, because I also don't understand the stages. And the ones that are on hold, are, uh, are they on hold because of, of, of COVID or are they on hold because of budget constraints? That would be all for now. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Member Barnes. Member Van Vogel? Member Van Vogel, are you online? Yes, Chairperson. Please, Member. Yeah, Chair, um, 
mine. I, I also want to mention, I think uh, the HOD is a star. <laughs> yeah, so, so um, I don't have words to, to explain of my gratitude towards these assistance where there's gaps in the department of health. So thanks HOD, you are a star. Uh, I, I can see you are really in uh, serving the people who I need. Um, Chair, let me go. We have lost you, Member Benfogel. In fact, can you hear me now, Chair? Can you hear me, Chair? Yes, thank you, Member. Yes. Oh, what I want to know is what is the total number of infection, infections at the hospital as, at the moment? Of let's say uh, as as at today, yes. um, because I like what Paul Hospital in their presentation they give us the status of of of, of what is happening now. Uh, I don't want that uh, that clarity. Uh, I know I missed out, but I didn't. Uh, I saw that. And then the other uh, question, Chairperson. Um, what I want to understand is the reason for the high infections in certain areas. Uh, and then um, if the eyes uh, in the 15th and 27th May, uh, as reflected on the graph, uh, uh, what, 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 why, why is it? Uh, maybe they can just explain to me that. Um, then the last one is on slide 11, 12, Chairperson. Um, um, want to understand the involvement of labor unions in this assessment. The reason why I'm asking is because they are a key stakeholder in the process. And, and if you can please explain to uh, me what is meant by PPEs, not in or, or caring for patients, isn't it? This exposing staff the, the, the issue on the Member, infrastructure. I'm not sure Member Van Vogel, so allowed to, to ask. Yeah. Member yeah. Van Vogel, sorry to interrupt you. I believe your last question was was very unclear. Can you perhaps just repeat yourself, please? Is it the one of the unions or the PPEs? The unions, I think, yes. What is the involvement of labor unions in these? I asked the, the, the question, I think, because they, they play a key uh, role in this process. They are key players in this process. So I want to understand what is their role as the, the role of the unions in this. Shepherson, on the infrastructure. Um, I just want to know the 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 could you particularly on the fire compliance uh, occurring and how does it impact service delivery? And then if if possible, uh, the last one chair is just uh, what is the update? The location and when is member Van Vogel. Member, um, the very last question we were unable to capture. I will now afford member Bota to pose a question and then we will try to get back to you on that one. Member Bota, please proceed. Thank you very much, Chair. I hope I'm more audible than member Van Vogel. Um, I Thank you. I just want to say to Dr. Kluter and to his department, um, well done for being the forerunners in this um, uh, pandemic that we are in or were in. And um, I know that we have done motions of um, um, congratulations or, yeah, um, but I, I just want to say to this department, to the, your whole department, and especially to the forerunners of, um, you know, all our nurses and doctors um, in the front line, thank you, thank you, thank you for what you have done and for what you have meant 
for our communities out there. Um, I then want to ask in regard to Dr. Erasmus's presentation, um, in regard to staff that has contacted um, the COVID virus and um, those who have um, um, recovered, I want to ask how have you in regard to those um, nurses or frontline staff who have not contracted the virus per se, but how have you allayed those fears of them that they could contract and how what have you done to keep them abreast of being there for those community patients that came in although they might also have feared of contracting because of their colleagues have contracted the virus thank you chair thank you very much member bota uh, member van Vogel. Let's see if you are better audible at this time. Can you hear me, Chair? We can hear you, can... member. Yeah, my last question was on the central hospital. What is the update and where is the location and when is it likely to be completed and at what cost? Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, um, members. Um, that concludes the round of questions by members. Um, I just have a question in terms of the risk mitigation strategy. Um, was there any impact of a voluntary services um, across those two facilities that impacted on, on that as well? And then I'm covered by the member that spoke to um, the delays in terms of budget or um, COVID at this period. Uh, the department will now proceed to answer these questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Chairperson, and, and thank you for the committee members um, for the acknowledgement um, of the members of our department. Um, I, I must go on record with you in this committee that it's been an absolute pleasure for me to be the head of a department of so many wonderful people, all the way down to the frontline staff um, that has, has really done heroic work um, in this period of time. But to commend specifically today the managers that we have in our system, it is not an easy thing, and it was an easy thing to manage institutions to the size of Paul, uh, Paul Hospital in this case, but in Tigerberg Hospital specifically, um, with the pre-existing challenges that existed pre-COVID, and then to manage the hospital and the institution the way that the management teams have managed the hospitals with COVID during this period of time, I really take my hat off to all the managers in the, depart in the department. So my personal appreciation to Dr. Erasmus and his team, uh, to Mr. Van Abad and his team, and then specifically also to Dr. Angeletti, the two and the team. I mean, they've done nothing short of miraculously how the infrastructure colleagues have supported us across the platform. So it's against that backdrop that I will <clears throat> address some of these um, concerns and the questions from the members, just for clarity. So Member Barnes, I think the, the issue about, um, you ask a very important question. The role of cleaning in hospitals is normally done by the cleaning staff. And in many cases, we have internal cleaning staff, but in many cases, we also have outsourced cleaning services. So I think you need to understand the, 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 the distinction between that we don't have a completely in-house cleaning service and a completely outsourced cleaning service. We have a combination of the two. So that is when we have cleaning personnel either employed by ourselves or cleaning personnel that's brought in by contract and their job is to clean surfaces and to clean um, institutions. What Mr. Van Abad specifically was referring to is the cleaning protocols are observed in every single unit, every single area. People clean the surfaces and they do what they need to do. When we have confirmation of a positive case, according to our policy, what we then do is we do over and above the normal cleaning we do what we call additional high, um, you know, kind of um, cleaning in that spirit, in that area, deep cleaning. And it's in that specific instance where we then bring in specifically a company to come in to do that specific task. That's over and above the normal cleaning. Um, then in terms of um, 
the Tigerberg Hospital completed projects and those on hold. I will ask Dr. Angeli de Tue just to give you the explanation. My understanding is that we have the completed projects that were listed in the presentation. So it's the kitchen, the theater, and uh, the lifts. And we are in the process of completing a whole lot of other ones. Um, your, your question is, where are we with the projects in relation to the priorities? And the ones on hold, is it due to COVID or is it due to money? My understanding, it's a combination of the two, but Dr. Angeletti Tutu can give that specific detail. Uh, member Allen, your question about isolation is a very important question. It is something that we grappled with. It's one of those things that we had to learn quickly to adjust. And that is when psychiatric patients become COVID positive or um, COVID exposed. So you understand the difference between COVID positive and COVID exposed. And the one needs quarantine, the other one needs isolation. Um, and that has been a singular challenge um, everywhere. So you would have find the notice in both Paul and in, um, in, in, in um, Tigerberg, where they also then focus in the psychiatric unit if somebody becomes positive. So what people normally do, remember, Alan, and this is how each hospital re uh, uh, responded. They, if there's a risk of somebody that is, uh, if somebody's a COVID positive psychiatric, is to find isolation for that specific um, um, patient. Now, if there is facilities where you can isolate in a side ward or away from other people, that's what we've done. Um, if there is somebody that's been exposed and they need to be quarantined, there's also a separation required, but it must be separate from people that's not exposed and not. So it's posed a real, <clears throat> real challenge. And between our general hospitals with psychiatric facilities and then our psychiatric hospitals, <clears throat> we've had to manage this quite sensitively across the platform. But again, we did quite well in relation um, to that. Then a member of if I understood the, 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 the questions, um, I apologize if I don't get it all right. Um, the total number of infections at, <clears throat> at <clears throat> at all hospitals, we had 5,345 healthcare workers, the total infected uh, two days ago. That's the total across all Western Cape government institutions. Um, of that, there were only 235 active cases. Um, and uh, the new cases recently has been very few in relation to that. So I'll ask, uh, you, you saw the new cases and the testing in Paul, has been very few new cases. I'll ask Dr. Um, Dr. Erasmus just to confirm the newly confirmed cases and the current active cases. I think he did mention it in the presentation, but I'll just ask him to confirm that specific one. Your question about why is the infections high in specific areas? I think it's um, a combination of two things, um, um, Member Van Vogel. If you found, if you look at, at both Paul and at um, and Tigerberg, you will find that the highest areas of infection is not necessarily where the COVID patients found themselves. It is other areas of the hospital. And it's a combination of that, that um, the infection in those areas are A, because of volumes of people moving through the area, and then B, um, that a lot of the infections actually occur when people, our staff members, are coming casually in relation to one another. That's why you heard in, um, in Paul, they made that big issue about tea rooms, lifts, because they identified that those are the places where people get together. And it's not necessarily where COVID patients are. That is where our own staff members, and you might have screened negative that morning, no temperature, but you might have been exposed to COVID. And that's the risk um, in terms of uh, transmission between our own staff members. But the big area is once we've identified an area, it's then to actually do a, a response in that area to look at how to break transmission in those areas um, in, in that regard. The involvement of labor unions we've taken very um, seriously in this province, uh, Member Van Vogel. Um, we are meeting twice, uh, we, we started meeting weekly with our labor union reps from the chamber with our senior management team, which I was there myself, our senior management team meet weekly. We've now moved that to two weekly with the agreement of the of the unions. So we meet every two weeks to, to say what are the key issues and all of that. We've then also made sure that at every institutional level, they help us to say we need to make sure that at institutional level, the unions are involved with what is called an IMLC, 
So the engagement between the union and the management. We've also tried to put a lot of store in getting those functional um, things. But the big thing is that we've now got Occupation Health and Safety Committee. We have a provincial one. The unions also serve on that one. And then we have district ones and institutional Occupation Health and Safety Committees. And it's quite important that the unions, and you will see the Dr. Erasmus actually said that, if you do the area risk assessment, it's important that the organized labor reps, the union reps, also sign off in terms of what happened in those area assessment areas. I think your question on PPEs, I didn't quite get so clearly. My assumption is you were asking about um, what is regarded as PPEs, and the answer is that we have a PPE policy that is in relation to the risk. So Dr. Erasmus explained uh, your personal risk, the risk of exposure in the area that you work, and therefore based on that risk, we have guidelines of what PPE is used in which setting, which is commensurate to risk. Um, and we have sufficient PPE everywhere, and we've really had an ongoing engagement with organized labor and with our own staff in terms of their fears in terms of the appropriateness of the PPE that we're deploying in each of the areas. Um, the infrastructure question around fire compliance, I will ask Dr. Angeletti to, 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 to bring back, um, just to come and make sure that we have the fire compliance issue and where it sits with the infrastructure projects at Tigerberg. And then the location of the central hospital. The central hospital location is supposed to be at Tigerberg Hospital at the premises. But what we have pre previously presented to this committee is the the process will work in phases. The first phase is to do the regional hospital on the site in Berlin. Once you have that regional hospital site Berlin, then you can relocate some of the services that's currently in Tigerberg to the regional hospital, which opens the space for you to have the central hospital. So the central hospital is, the, is a step after the regional hospital. And we first need to do the regional hospital to be able to do the confirmation of the central hospital process. Um, Member Buta, the staff infections, um, the people that's not infected, I think that's a very good question. Not all our staff members have been infected. We've actually worked out the percentage that 5,300 that I've spoke to you about constitutes 14% of all healthcare workers in the Western Cape government. That means 84% of our staff members have not been infected. The issue is that 84% of our staff members, which were actually quite concerned and anxious at the beginning, a, have learned so much from PPE protecting themselves. I can tell you if there's people that understand social distancing, hand washing, <laughs> wearing masks, on their way to work, on their way from work, in community settings, it's health workers. Health workers understand what it means to not be exposed. And I guess all our health workers have actually realized their risk of being infected in the community is probably higher than the risk of being infected in the hospital because that's when they are letting the guard down and they could come into contact with other people. So I guess the non-infected healthcare workers are probably some of your most socially responsible people in communities that are adhering to, to safeguarding. And because they've seen a lot of their own staff member that became infected come back and started work and recovered, there's been the fear has been mitigated. And people have accepted their infected colleagues back um, and this outpouring of compassion has just been the overriding experience that we've had, Member Bota. So a concern that a health worker that might have not been infected previously feel a little bit scared of helping somebody from the community. I think in my own experience, the compassion has completely overtaken that. People have looked after themselves, but they've also reconciled that their job is to make sure that they look after members of the community that needs them. And, 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 and that's what I experienced at the Hospital of Hope last week. It's just phenomenal that every single person that comes in that place is COVID positive. The staff members that are not infected, they go out of their way to treat people with humanity, with dignity, while protecting themselves and not get infected. So, so I think there's a big story to be told of how that's happened amongst our area. And Chippers, in your question about, um, if I understand the issue about volunteers um, coming into our system, We've had a very clear process of volunteers also being protected by the PPE. We've obviously tried to limit the volunteers because you don't want volunteers to be exposed, but we've had very few instances of volunteers becoming positive or volunteers introducing infection into the system. So there's been a very clear occupation and IPC process. Um, and, and 
the students, the medical students returning onto the platform is a good example. We've had to go through a whole process of what it would mean for people coming onto the platform in relation to them. And I guess your question, your last question, is about the delays for infrastructure as well, which I will refer to um, Dr. Angeletti Dutue. So if I can just ask Dr. Angeletti Dutue to respond to the infrastructure questions, and then if Dr. Uh, Erasmus can just talk about the specifics at um, Tigerberg in terms of the number of um, people infected at Tigerberg. Thanks, Chairperson. Thank, thank you very much, Dr. Kluter, uh, Dr. Angeletti Dutue, and then Dr. Erasmus in that order. Thank you. Yes, th thank you very much. So the project that uh, we have completed are the uh, upgrading of the air conditioning in the Block C, that is where the operating theater is, as well as uh, some, uh, as I mentioned, two of the lift uh, that uh, we have uh, ongoing maintenance and upgrading of the 31. Then uh, the other one that we complete is the uh, upgrading of the theater complex in Block B, as well as the main kitchen that I showed the photo, as well as uh, what happened in, uh, in uh, March, we had, to, um, accel uh, we had to change some of the priorities because with COVID, so we spend uh, 5.5 million in upgrading wards for uh, admitting COVID patients. So that is uh, the project that has been completed and the other ones that are in construction are all of them in accordance with the priorities that uh, we have established to look first at the safety of the facility in, uh, in, uh, in relation to patient and staff. So that is the upgrading of the, uh, the electrical installation and the, and the, and the rest of the, the project. So this is uh, the project that we currently have. The issue about the safety, uh, of course, uh, the fire compliance, uh, as I mentioned, we cannot uh, embark in the fire compliance uh, project because there are different uh, aspects. There is a fire prevention and fire uh, fire mitigation and fire uh, uh, detection. So we are working at the facing. So we are facing uh, the fire compliance uh, uh, again. It's like the lift program. It's an ongoing kind of, uh, of, uh, of project. And we are at the moment looking at the fire compliance, for example, for the escape. Uh, one of the projects is in planning is escape route uh, that we are looking at the moment with the upgrading of the, the staircase, uh, the external staircase. And the, and, the, and the protection, the lighting there. So it's, it's, the, it's that is one of the top priority and we'll do it in, 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 in phases. And the, and the other one on the, on the prioritization, as I mentioned in the budget, some projects are on hold because of course we are the level five. So uh, all the work activity were put on hold for um, that period. And then slowly they could, be, could come back, but not all the project actually are, uh, uh, you know, for example, some projects that are uh, right in, the, in, the, in, the, uh, in some area where there were COVID patients, we, we, we didn't allow the um, professional service provider to go inside, you know, just to prevent uh, uh, possible uh, spreading of, of the virus. So now slowly we are uh, restarting. And of course, some funds went for the COVID uh, uh, project. So we, we are continuously looking at reprioritization and, but the plan is to continue the implementation with the funding that we have uh, available in accordance to the priority for the safety. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Angliati. The toy, Dr. Erasmus, you may proceed. Thank you. So with respect to the staff infections, to date we have 850 staff members who have been, who have been tested positive. And of those, 684 have already returned to work. In other words, they've completely recovered from, from their illness. And uh, in last week, the, 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 the weekly average for last week was only one staff member that tested positive, and we had no uh, staff members testing positive in the last two days. So that's the status in terms of the staff members who have tested positive. Just in relation to the question that was asked uh, uh, with respect to the fear among staff, so the fear among staff is actually a very real thing. That that anxiety and fear has been found to be very tangible. I personally engage with staff members, and when you look into their eyes and you hear their stories about what they are fearful of, it's it's unbelievable to be able to to understand where the fear comes from. Sometimes that fear is born out of irrationality. Other times it is real concern that they have about themselves and about their families, and one has to understand that. And my engagement with staff is always that 
I am COVID positive, you are COVID positive, and therefore we need to maintain social distance, we need to wear masks, we need to wash our hands, and we need to ensure that we understand that. Because tomorrow we don't know whether I will be COVID positive or not. And that was the engagement staff. We've also, besides the Metropolitan Health e EAP program, that has been on a weekly basis, been giving debriefing sessions to staff, We've also, in, in collaboration with the university, the psychiatric department, set up a resilience clinic fairly early in the process where staff members also had access to that kind of, of, of access in terms of, of getting emotional support and psycho, psychosocial support through, through that space. And the key thing that emerged out of those engagements has also been predominantly staff and nurses in particular being fearful of taking the virus home from the workplace. So, so those are the key things that, that came out in terms of the fears that they express. Uh, and we and think really that is really an ongoing engagement with staff. So when summit is positive in the area, that there is an outreach to staff, that there is support to the staff member who's tested positive and also support to those unit people for them to understand the dynamics of what it is. And again, to reinforce that they need to maintain the, the, the standard practices in terms of keeping safe. And very often, uh, when you have a staff member having the full protective equipment being utilized in a clinical area such as an ICU, when they step out of that into a tea room, they, their guard sometimes drops. And that is where we need to focus on cons constantly to ensure that the guard never gets dropped when you move out of a clinical area into a non-clinical area. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Erasmus. Uh, Member Barnes, is that a hand from the previous round or do you have a follow-up? Member apologies, Barnes. Chair. Apologies, apologies, Chair. I forgot to lower my hand. Sure. Thank you very much, um, Members. Are there any other questions from any member? I recognize Member Baku Baku Force. Thank you, Chair. No, first of all, uh, I want to congratulate the health staff for their work that they are doing for our community. It's been a difficult time, but they forge forward. And I have a, a, um, a question. After um, I, I want to know, after you've been diagnosed with COVID-19 and then again you are diagnosed with it positive again, what does that mean? Because in my case, there was something that they called a footprint. I want to understand what is a footprint, what does it mean when they are saying you shouldn't worry that you will get ill, but it was only a footprint. So that's what I want to understand when it comes to to to, to the COVID-19 um, um, disease. Thank you, Che. I will allow you question, Member Baku Baku Force. Dr. Kluter. Thank you very much, Member, uh, the Chairperson and Member Baku Baku Force. And um, um, really good to see that you're back at work and, and, and fully recovered. Um, the, the, the question was asked me at the time, <laughs> and I tried to explain to the best of my ability what, what the technical answer is. Um, what we have is that the, the confirmation test, the confirmation test of COVID is when, and you, you heard when we talk about the sample, either the back of your throat or in your nose, a sample is taken and it's been taken to a laboratory. And what the laboratory does in the confirmation test, we call it PCR. What they do is they take um, out, of the, out of the sample, they take and they test for evidence of RNA. Now RNA is, it's like the component part of the virus. So you test and then you find RNA evidence. Now that is, it's not nothing to do with the blood. It is in the sample that an RNA is almost like, if you understand um, um, uh, DNA and RNA, it, it gives you um, evidence that the virus was present. So you, 
you do the sample and you find evidence from RNA, which is a similar thing to DNA, that says, okay, we find evidence of RNA that there is virus present. Now, that is what we use in the confirmatory case to say you are COVID positive. Now, what has happened is everybody that gets tested, the evidence and the research says that after 14 days, or actually after eight days of becoming positive, so it's either from the day that your symptoms started or if you're asymptomatic from the day that you got a positive test or if you were in a hospital from the day that you were discharged, because you were clinically stable. 14 days initially was, 14 days we said that you automatically um, recovered and you didn't need to have a second test to confirm that you are recovered. Now I'll explain to you why that is. In under research conditions, most people that have the virus that has this DNA or RNA confirmed evidence of the virus, they are, after eight days, their spreading of the virus is virtually zero. So you don't spread the virus to others because you don't then become infected after eight days. That is why the 14 days became 10 days later because the, the isolation period then was reduced from 14 days to 10 days without having to test a second time. What has happened in this case, in your case, if you had to test again, there were still traces of the RNA footprint, put it that way. But you weren't infected, if you understand. And that was what was confusing a lot of people because you still have what is called inactive remnants of the virus in your system, but you don't pose a risk to others. It will eventually out of your body, it will be shed out of your body and that is what the footprint conversation was. It's a technical answer. And the technical answer basically says the first time when you were tested, there was evidence of the virus. After 10 days or 14 days, you were completely recovered. The second time you were tested, there's still evidence of the virus, but you're not infected to other people. That was the, the whole um, story. As insofar as people really becoming reinfected, there's a few instances across the world where there are now documented cases that after three or four or five months, people are exposed again. They don't have automatic um, immunity and they become reinfected. And those cases has mainly been when it's been a completely different strain of the virus because there is still evidence to suggest if you've had it once, your likelihood is that you've got some antibodies and you have some protective protection against the virus. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank, Thank you, you very much, uh, Dr. Kluter. Uh, Member Bakabaku Force, I'm sure you are covered to an extent. And should you have any follow ups, I'm sure that you can directly engage with the department um, on that. Um, colleagues, I, I don't say, see any. Good. Thank you very much, Member Bakabaku Force. Uh, members, I don't see any follow up questions from your side. Um, from my side, I also wish to thank the department. Members have expressed their sincere thanks and appreciation to the Western Cape Health Department on their dedication and commitment during this period. You have been indeed outstanding in serving the people of this province. I will further propose to the committee that we resolve as a multi-party committee and as the oversight body to formally convey our appreciation to the department in order to convey to all facility managers and the staff. Um, you found the time, um, Dr. Kluter and your team, to prepare lengthy presentations and detailed information to present to the standing committee, as well as to the ad hoc committee. And we thank you for keeping us informed and for accounting a great deal in great length and in great detail. Um, I really wish to thank you again for your presence and your presentations this morning. Uh, Dr. Kluter, just a short question or last question from my side. At this point in time, can you please just um, enlighten the committee on the safety protocols at um, facilities at this time? Should we um, conduct any visits? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chairperson, for those, for those really words of appreciation. It is really appreciated by our staff in the management. Um, 
Uh, as indicated by Dr. Erasmus and um, uh, Mr. Van der Bant, um, the we are open for visits to institutions, but obviously protecting the people presenting themselves to our institutions, you must be you must recognize we still have patients and we have areas where there is risk of contracting COVID. So although we are open for visits, we conduct those visits mainly in relation to minimizing the risk of the visitors coming to the institution. So our management teams prefer to do it in areas that are safe, at social distancing, with masks, and do briefings in accordance. And if there is to be any um, questions for examining or visiting specific areas, like Dr. Angeletti de Toy said, it will be based on the risk that that area at that specific point poses for, con for, for contracting um, the virus, both from the perspective of people, the visitors themselves potentially having COVID that they don't know and giving it to our own staff, and then from a perspective that the visitors themselves can con potentially contract. So it is on an area by area basis that we make those assessments in each of our institutions. But you heard quite the detail of what those are. Yes. And each management team makes those calls based on the assessment of each individual unit. Thank you, Chair. Absolutely. Thank you very much um, once again, um, Dr. Kluter, for the clarity in that regard. And thank you so much for your time and all your efforts. And thank you to your entire team. You are now excused. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Yeah, bye now. Thank you. Bye. Members, just please stay on the line for, for a few minutes. Thank you very much, members. Members, we do not have any um, meeting documentation that we need to approve at this time. Um, I thought in um, speaking to the procedural officer, Ms. Jamke, that we should have a look at our program, our draft program as a committee. Uh, members, you will also remember that um, Almost in every committee, we've asked members to kindly engage with myself or the procedural officer to please add to the program. Um, I'm not sure, Mrs. Jamke, have you received any additions or amendments from other members? No, Chair, nothing. Not at the time? Not at the time. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, Committee members, can we perhaps speak to, can you perhaps share the um, the draft program? Thank you very much, Ms. Jamke. Oops. Can you see it, sir? Uh, not yet. There we can see it now. Yes, thank you very much, members. We've dealt with today on the 2nd of September, the department has indicated there is a cabinet engagement on the 1st and the 2nd, which was initially for them to do another presentation. So members, I would like to have your, your input and your response or your indulgence on the committee um, program going forward. Is there anything else from your side that you would like to add? Just on the 2nd of September, there is no um, EMS, there is a center in Paul, but um, the calls get um, directed from the Cape Islands um, center. It's actually in Booster. So that would be the most appropriate uh, facility in terms of emergency services to should we then decide to conduct that visit. Chair, you're not noting my hand. Member Gorta, please proceed. Thank you. Um, I was going to then um, um, propose that the um, no, that we only do the EMS then on that day. 
and not the two facilities. No. Okay, other members? Member noted, thank you, Member Bota. Member Baku Baku Falls? Member Baku Falls, is that the hand from the presentation? Members, there has been a proposal from Member Bota that on the 2nd of September, we visit the EMS Centre in Worcester. Are all members in agreement? Chair. Member Chair. Baku Baku first, and then Member Barnes. Thank you. Thank you, my Chair. I'm getting in and out. I don't know what's happening with my network. But I wanted to propose that can't we visit Hoda Clinic in Dragonstein area, please? Noted member. You mean on that day? Yes, leader. Yes, my okay. leader. All right. We just need to be considerate of the time and then um, other members for the commitments um, on the day. We just need to see what, what the time span will be between the facilities. Then we may consider. Member Barnes, was that you? Yeah, it, it, it was me. Thank you, Chair. Chair, I, I am actually now supporting Member Baku Force because I wanted to understand from 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 Member Porter the reason of us not going to to the hospital and just doing one. But if we can substitute, then I'm fine with it. No, thank you, Member Member Bota. Jay, I, I'm I, I um I'm just looking at the parliamentary program and I don't know of the members on in this committee who is in the standing committee of the premier there is a meeting at one o'clock so i would propose that we rather start very early and is there a reason why we then cannot do the hoda clinic as well as the booster ems Sorry, um, my apologies, members. I just got um, some difficulties here. Members, are we then in agreement if we should uh, be able to start um, earlier that we then do the EMS Centre in Worcester and then the Gouda Clinic? Yes, Chairperson. On the second of, of yes, September. Yes, I wanted to ask now because Hoda is nearby. Can't we start in Hoda and then we went to to Worcester because Hoda is it, it, it's nearby. Okay, we will ask um, the procedural officer to work out the detail for us and then members. Um, the program as it is, uh, with your indulgence, um, you will have a. Kindly have a look at the program and please give your input um, further to to um, then finalize the program further. Is that OK? And you will then revert back to Ms. Jamke on that. Chair, can I just ask something? You may think. Please proceed, Member Bota. There is a um, OK, the, the EMS we are now doing on the 2nd of September, right? And then That's there is October, no date attached to it. I just want to check by October, are we in person meeting already? What do we have for October the 2nd? Yes, I think we will also need to um, consult um, member Bota as to the entire WCPP program as to exactly when um, all committees will be allowed to conduct in-person meetings. 
So we will also be guided by, by that um, directive as well. So we will also take up that up further and convey to the committee. Is that fine? Yes, Chair. Member Vota? Fine, fine with me, thank you. Thank you very much. Members, are there anything else on the program from your side? So we will agree then on the 2nd of September visiting the EMS Center in Worcester and then the Gouda Clinic. And on further engagement, um, members will send their proposals to Ms. Jamke as soon as possible. Um, concluding with that, um, members, do you have any resolutions stemming from um, the presentations that was presented this morning? Nothing from my side. Thank you very much, Member Bota. Any other members? Nothing? Members? None, None from my side. Thank you very much, Members. Much appreciated. Members, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your effort and thank you for your valuable input this morning. Um, and thank you also that we were able to engage on the program going forward. Um, members, thank you so much for your cooperation. I wish you a blessed day ahead, a blessed week ahead. Please keep safe um, where you go. And um, you may, must you have a very, very blessed um, day. Thank you so much. Um, this meeting is now adjourned. Thank you.